Hello, YouTube, and welcome back to another interview. Today, we have the exciting pleasure of welcoming a new uranium company to the channel. We're going to be talking about Sky Harbor Resources, and we have the CEO, Jordan Trimble, here with us. Hi, Jordan. How are you? I'm doing well. It's good to be here. Good to uh, share the story with you and uh, looking forward to our discussion. Thank you for being here. So without wasting any time, I'm going to jump straight in because it looks like uranium is off to a really solid start so far this year after a pretty terrific 2023. So I'm curious, from your point of view, um, where do you think uh, the uranium sector is going to go and why should investors pay attention to it? Because it appears like a bull market is starting um, in 2024. And where could that go from here and beyond? Well, it's a loaded question. Um, uranium was the top performing metal in 2023. It's been continuing to march higher. There's a myriad of reasons why this metal, this commodity is, is moving higher right now. Um, you know, we suffered through almost a decade of a, a, a long drawn out bear market uh, post Fukushima. Um, we've come out the other side. We're still in the early days, I think, of what will be a long sustained bull market. Um, as we talked offline, uh, you're from Saskatchewan, so you know this sector well. Um, as you probably recall in 06, 07, Uranium uh, price uh, moved as high as 130 to $140 a pound. Uh, we're at about 90 to 95 right now. So we're still a ways off that previous high. Obviously, if you factor in inflation, um, you're you know looking at in today's prices, uh, almost $200 a pound. So um, we'll see if it gets there again. I, I, I don't like to forecast specific prices, but there's some very, very strong uh, underlying uh, fundamentals for this commodity that are that that's leading to this upward pressure uh, that we're seeing. So we look at the demand side for this commodity, uh, about 190 to 200 million pounds of annual demand or consumption. That's primarily used for nuclear energy generation, right? So uranium is the fuel for the nuclear power plants globally. There's about 440 operable reactors globally, over 60 under construction, hundreds more ordered, planned, and proposed. That's not including any new small modular reactors or some of these new advanced nuclear techs uh, that are coming online. So the demand is quite robust. It's growing at about 4% a year. And that's that's been increasing in recent years as the sentiment towards nuclear energy is the only source of baseload, emissions-free, reliable, scalable, affordable electricity generation. The sentiment around uh, this source of clean energy has improved drastically. So we're seeing countries the world over uh, move to nuclear. You look at a place like China, for example, mm -hmm. really leading the charge in this uh, new growth. Uh, they're planning to build 150 new nuclear uh, reactors in the next 15 years. That's uh, more nuclear generation, uh, energy generation and uranium demand coming on in China alone in the next 15 years than has come on globally in the last 35 years. If you look at Western nations that have existing uh, nuclear uh, infrastructure and, and, and power plants, uh, a lot of them have reversed their energy policies in recent years or have even doubled down uh, on their uh, nuclear expansion programs. Uh, you look at Canada, the US, France in particular, more recently announcing plans to uh, to, to build another 14 reactors. So uh, we're seeing basically, you know, the entire world gravitate towards nuclear for all the right reasons. So the demand is quite robust uh, and it's gonna be augmented with, again, small modular reactors and some new uh, advanced nuclear techs that are coming online. However, uh, when we're consuming 190 to 200 million pounds, um, oh, and one last note too, this COP28, uh, conference in Dubai, uh, 22 mm -hmm. countries signed off uh, on a declaration to triple nuclear capacity by 2050. So mm -hmm. a very strong demand, um, but we're only producing about 140 to 145 million pounds of primary mine supply. Now that structural supply deficit uh, has been met with secondary supplies, whether it be mobile inventories, whether it be underfeeding, or even previously the downblending of, of weapons grade material to fuel these nuclear uh, power plants, um, that secondary supply is dwindling, it's drying up. And that's one of the main reasons we're seeing uh, this price uh, move higher. It's important to note uh, that the cost of a reactor for a nuclear utility, the fuel cost is a relatively small amount uh, of the overall cost of a nuclear power plant. So what does that mean? That means that the utility company, the purchasing manager is relatively price insensitive, which is one of the main reasons why we could continue to see the price move higher. When a nuclear utility needs the fuel, they buy it uh, at whatever price uh, they can get it at when they need it. And we're coming into a situation where that's gonna become even more 
uh, prominent throughout the industry. So um, the supply side right now, we, we need more supply. There just isn't the new uh, meaningful amount of supply that can come online in the next few years, especially in the West. It's important to note that uh, most supply globally, primary mine supply, uh, comes from countries like Kazakhstan, Russia, Uzbekistan, Niger, um, less friendly jurisdictions to the West. Uh, and the West has been heavily reliant on uh, these Eastern sources, if you will, of uranium over the last few decades. We've just seen now over the last several months, and it uh, looks like it's going to come uh, into full effect here shortly, uh, a new bill uh, in the United States that's officially banning uh, the import of uranium from Russia. That's going to stress uh, certainly stress the U.S. nuclear utilities that have uh, relied on uh, the Russians for about 25 percent of their uranium. They're going to have to now source that elsewhere. So you know, this market, the supply sites continued uh, to be uh, constricted. Uh, and as a result of that, you're seeing um, these the, this upward pressure on the price as we're seeing the demand continuing to grow. So it's a very exciting time, obviously, for uranium investors and for uranium uh, equities as the equity market right now, as we talked about offline, uh, it's lagged the uranium price uh, more recently. The equities have underperformed, especially the smaller and mid caps. Now, this is not unusual as these, these companies typically outperform um, later in the cycle. And, and our company, Sky Harbor Resources, uh, is a, a smaller cap exploration and early stage development company uh, in the Athabasca Basin in northern Saskatchewan. So we're excited for this next phase of the bull market. So I can hear the excitement in your voice, and that's a really good sign because uh, I agree with you where there's more beta. So as that uh, as the uranium price starts to move, big caps move second like Cameco, pretty close to all-time highs. And then we usually see those smaller caps move, but usually with much bigger returns. So that's why I was excited for this interview because we have a chance to learn about another company. But something else I, I remember from 2023 was that there was a pretty big breakthrough in fusion where um, we're, we're currently talking about current demand. But as things continue to grow, there's only going to be even more demand come online because we're not sure how these technologies will be applied quite yet. Um, so I do want to jump in and learn more about Sky Harbor, but I'm um, sorry, uh, talk more about uh, your, your assets. But first, would you mind giving me an elevator pitch if people are not familiar with the company? So um, who is Sky Harbor and how did you get involved? Yeah, so Sky Harbor Resources, as I mentioned, is a uh, uh, exploration, high-grade uranium exploration and early stage development company. We've been around for 10 years. We've now built what is uh, by acreage, the third largest mineral tenure holding uh, in Northern Saskatchewan in the Athabasca mm. Basin, the richest depository of uranium in the world and consistently ranked as a top mining district um, uh, by the Fraser Institute. These projects range from earlier stage exploration properties right through to more advanced stage exploration assets uh, that do host uh, either small uranium resources and or high grade multi-percent uranium in previous drilling. Uh, so Sky Harbor uh, really uh, is being built to be a one-stop shop for investors looking to get high-grade uranium uh, exploration and discovery exposure in the Athabasca Basin, as well as exposure to prospect generation. We have a dual or a hybrid model at the company. We're out there actively drilling and advancing our main projects. And then we look to bring in partner companies uh, to advance our secondary and tertiary projects. So it, it creates a very catalyst rich story. Uh, and uh, again, this is the best place in the world to be looking for new high grade uranium deposits. Thank you for that, Jordan. It's uh, it's good to know uh, what you guys do, and we're going to dive in a little bit deeper now. So um, the Athabasca, Athabasca Basin is considered to be like the most widely, uh, like it's the biggest deposit, it's the most friendly environment, um, but there's a lot of competitors there. So what I'm wondering is, could you please, like, I know you gave a quick overview of the Athabasca Basin, but uh, like just for scale, like why is, why is everyone like looking at this region? And then like we talked about uh, part two of this question is, um, if there's a lot of other players in this region, how do you differentiate? Like, why should investors be looking at your stock and your company right now? Yeah, look, it's a great question. I mean, um, you know, simply put, there aren't that many um, jurisdictions globally that produce mm -hmm. uranium. There, you can count them on one hand, really. Um, as I mentioned, places like Kazakhstan, Russia, Uzbekistan, Niger, other parts of Africa, e Africa, yes, there's public companies operating there. Um, but when you look at Kazakhstan, Russia, not a lot of public companies operating and looking for developing uranium mines in those parts of the world. So it really kind of narrows it down to the Athabasca Basin, uh, parts of the US, Australia, 
that's really it in the West. And as far as grade is concerned, high grade deposits, uh, nothing compares to the Athabasca Basin. The average grade there is about 10 to 20 times that of the global average. And that's important because when you're an exploration or a development company, um, you're, you're looking for and developing projects uh, that are potentially multi-billion dollar deposits, right? They're very high value deposits. And that's what's so exciting uh, about our story right now is uh, we're in the process of just starting up a, a couple of drill programs actually mm -hmm. at our two main uh, projects, two co-flagship projects, Russell Lake and more. Uh, we've got 5,000 meters of drilling planned at Russell. Following that, we've got 3,000 meters of drilling at Moore. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, and happy to get into more detail there, but um, that's also one of, I'd say, the differentiating features of Sky Harbor. So these two co-flagship projects uh, in our portfolio, Russell, uh, we are acquiring from Rio Tinto, um, one mm -hmm. of the largest mining companies in the world. They're now a large strategic shareholder uh, of Sky Harbor and could very well become a JV partner at the project. Uh, this project we had in our crosshairs for a number of years. We finally inked the deal with Rio uh, about a year and a half ago, and we just completed last year an inaugural 9,600-meter uh, drill program, intersected some of the strongest zones of uranium mineralization in that drill program, and we're following that right back up now with a 5,000-meter program. Um, on this project, you also have the road. Uh, to the to the north of us is the richest, highest grade uranium deposit in the world, mm. owned a mine owned and operated by Cameco called MacArthur River. So that's just to the north of Russell and more. The road that services that mine connects the mine to the mill, which is one of only two operating mills to the south of Russell Lake, uh, the Key Lake Mill. So that road connects uh, the, the mine with the mill, runs right up through our project. There's power lines there. And we've also inherited an exploration camp from Rio at Russell Lake. So this brings our drill and exploration costs down quite significantly at Russell. So 5,000 meters that'll commence here shortly at Russell, uh, following up on the success of the program in 2023. Adjacent to Russell is our Moore Lake project. Now this has been the flagship in the company since 2016. There's high, it's an advanced stage exploration project. There's been a fair bit of drilling there. Uh, we've had a lot of success with previous drilling. We've had drill results highlighted by 21% U308 over a meter and a half. Uh, that was within six meters of 6%. To give you an idea uh, of what that means, 1% U308 or uranium uh, is equivalent in value to about an ounce of gold uh, per ton. So for those that are familiar with gold exploration, um, th these are very, very, very rich um, deposits. And uh, we've, uh, as I mentioned there at, at Moore Lake at what's called the Maverick Zone, um, intersected uh, some very high grade mineralization. We're planning to go right back into that high grade zone with the 3000 meters. And uh, as well, we'll be testing some regional targets at the project. So 8,000 meters, fully funded. We've got just under 10 million in the treasury. Uh, this program should run um, uh, at about three to three and a half million. Uh, so we'll have plenty of, of money to follow up with a, with summer drill programs as well. So those are the two main projects, both of which are advanced stage exploration projects, strategically located really in the heart of the eastern part of the Athabasca Basin uh, on that main mine trend. And also uh, one last note, um, our largest corporate shareholder is Denison Mines. Um, in fact, their president and CEO, Dave Cates, is on our board. He's a director mm -hmm. of Sky Harbor. Their flagship project, Wheeler River, where they're developing a uranium, ISR uranium mine, uh, is adjacent to Russell Lake. And in fact, a number of the targets that we're drill testing at Russell are the continuation of these uraniferous corridors or structures uh, from Denison's Wheeler River project. So um, these are two very, Russell and more two very strategically located advanced stage exploration assets. So that's a differentiating feature. We, we've got, as I mentioned, a couple of projects that do host small resources, uh, high grade as well. I just went over Russell and more, uh, but we've got a couple dozen other projects. And this is another differentiating feature of Sky Harbor is this hybrid model uh, where we're actively drilling and advancing our main projects, but we're also uh, advancing our secondary and tertiary projects through prospect generation, whereby we bring in partner companies uh, that then option uh, or earn into these projects by making cash and share payments annually to Sky Harbor. So mm -hmm. we get cash flow. We haven't had to raise a hard dollar in a financing in well over three years. A big part of that is the fact that we've, we've got cash flow coming in from these partner companies. But most importantly, they have to fund the exploration at these various projects. So we've got two now joint ventures, uh, one with Arano, which is a, a large 
um, uranium mining um, company based in Paris, um, France's largest nuclear fuel company. Um, they're a JV partner at a Preston project. We're doing some work with them at that project uh, this upcoming year. Uh, as in court, another JV partner uh, at the East Preston project. And then we have a handful of other companies at various other projects in our portfolio that are still actively earning in. We're expecting four or five of these uh, partner companies to be funding drill and exploration programs this year. So it's a, it becomes a very catalyst rich story, not just with our two main projects, but with these other uh, handful of other projects that are, are being funded by partner companies. So Jordan, you're really talking my language because uh, as you mentioned, I'm from Saskatchewan and I'm very familiar with that region, uh, notably that your neighbor is uh, the biggest dog in the sector. So um, that says a lot. And then as you're talking more, I heard Rio Tinto, I heard Denison Mines. So what I'm asking myself is it appears like this is a little bit more de-risked than I might have thought before we before we talked. And um, to get the kind of uh, backing or approval from those types of names, it means there's usually something there. It's usually the management team and it's usually a proven track record. So can you speak to that? Like, what is the what is the management team's uh, track record, and why why do they uh, why do they want to put this confidence in you? Yeah, I, no, it is. It's a it's a great stamp of approval. And look, we've built up along with the asset base, um, the twenty four projects covering over one point two million acres in northern Saskatchewan. Um, we've also assembled, I think, a, one of the the best management and technical teams uh, that we could over the last ten years. I've been running the company uh, since inception. I come mm. from a finance and entrepreneurial background. I was the corp dev manager at a gold company uh, called Bayfield Ventures, which we sold to New Gold um, uh, right before I started running Sky Harbor. Mm. Um, pro the gold project uh, became a part of what is now a producing mine, the Rainy River Mine. Uh, our, my chairman, uh, Jim Pettit, him and I work here uh, together, have worked together now for well over a decade. He was the CEO of that company. Um, so we've built and sold companies in the past. Um, uh, when you look at our technical team, uh, Dave Beard um, is our head geologist based in Saskatoon. He was at Cameco for a senior geologist at Cameco for uh, many years. Uh, he then left and uh, built and ultimately sold a company called JNR Resources. And an mm -hmm. interesting um, side note with JNR. So JNR went from a few million dollar valuation to well over 300 million in 06, 07. It ultimately was acquired by Denison in 2012. Um, JNR had a, a number of projects in it in, in that uh, 06, 07 period when we saw that big uranium uh, boom. Um, four of those projects are back in Sky Harbor's portfolio, uh, and we've got another 20 other projects. And as I mentioned, when that uranium market really took off in the mid 2000s, companies like JNR were trading at hundreds of millions of dollars in valuation. So there's a very strong re rating potential still that gets back to the point of the juniors, the, the small and mid cap names um, uh, moving the most later in the cycle. Sky Harbor is trading around a, a 90, $95 million valuation currently. So we are one of the larger junior companies. But uh, again, we've seen um, you know much uh, larger moves uh, with some of the, the larger cap names. And I do think we will see uh, that capital flow down into some of the, the mid and smaller cap names uh, as we uh, work our way through the cycle. And, and again, just getting back to some of the others um, that are on the management team and the board. I mentioned Dave Cates, who's the president and CEO of Dennis and Mines. He's a director of Sky Harbor, very close working relationship and strategic partnership with him and the team at Denison. Uh, we have another gentleman, um, uh, Joe Gallucci, who's the head of investment banking at Laurentian Bank, a big financial institution here in Canada. Uh, that's a director of the company, brings a wealth of capital markets experience. Uh, and then uh, rounding out the geological team, uh, Christine McKechnie, who's now our senior project geologist, uh, wrote uh, an award-winning thesis, geological thesis, on one of our deposits, the Fraser Lake Zone B deposit. She, too, like Dave, worked at Cameco. Um, and uh, we have a number of other junior geologists that we brought on in the last few years uh, that previously worked with NextGen and other uranium companies in the basin. So a great mix of uh, focused geological expertise in the Athabasca Basin, geos that have gone out made discoveries, worked with big uranium companies in the past, coupled with a management team and board of, director, uh, board of directors that uh, uh, can raise money, uh, know how to build companies, and ultimately uh, can transact uh, at the end of the day and uh, look uh, for an exit through some type of M&A. So I like everything you've said so far. And what we mentioned at the beginning of the interview was that we, we again, you and I both think that we're probably going to be heading higher. 
So if that's the case, um, why what what are, what are some catalysts uh, that are upcoming for the new year? Like you mentioned, mentioned some drill programs, um, but like what are some catalysts coming up for Sky Harbor in 2024 that investors should pay attention to? Yeah, uh, look, th this is right now it's a pivotal pivotal point for the company as we embark on um, what will be our our largest single season drill program, 8,000 meters combined. So 5,000 meters at Russell, 3,000 meters at Moore. Um, we're confident that we can deliver um, some new high-grade discoveries uh, and continue to expand the known high-grade zone at the Moore Lake project as well. Um, so keep an eye out for news flow from the, the, the drilling there. Uh, like I said, fully funded, and we'll, we'll follow up those programs with summer programs that are also fully funded. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we've got a handful of partner companies uh, that are going to be drilling and uh, carrying out exploration. We benefit from the news flow uh, from those companies. If any one of those companies has a major new discovery, uh, we benefit uh, uh, by holding a minority interest in the project at the end of the day. And we, we do uh, try to retain as much equity and stock in these partner companies as well. So you actually get exposure to a number of other exploration companies that we're partners with by owning shares of Sky Harbor. Uh, so, so all the news flow from uh, the, the exploration and drilling programs, that's going to be a um, big main source of catalysts over the next six to 12 months. But we're also actively negotiating on bringing in new option and JV partners. We've got a dozen or so other 100% owned projects um, that are available for option or for sale. Uh, so keep an eye out for, for new um, option agreements and, and JV partners coming in. Uh, and then last but not certainly not least is, um, you know, continuing to ride this uranium wave. I think, again, we're still in the early innings. Um, I think there's um, a, a lot more upside here. Uh, I think there's a lot more upside with the with the smaller and mid cap names as they catch up. If you look at the total combined market cap uh, or valuation of all publicly traded uranium equities globally, it's about 55, 60 billion or so. Mm -hmm. About half of that, though, is chemical and Kazatom prop. Okay. So that just shows you um, when you back out the two big uh, publicly traded producers, it's a relatively small drop in the bucket. Um, and, and so, you know, as capital does flow in to this sector, you're going to see, I think, uh, significant outperformance with uh, these smaller and mid cap uh, uranium companies, um, you know, Sky Harbor being one of those well positioned in the Athabasca Basin. Uh, and uh, we are in all of the uh, most of the major uranium mining ETFs as well. It's good liquidity in the company. Um, so yeah, it's it's um, there's there's a lot to look forward to a lot of catalysts company specific and more macro oriented catalysts that I think will uh, provide um, uh, for a, a, a very lucrative year this year. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Jordan, because uh, it's been refreshing to uh, to learn about the sector and learn about Sky Harbor. And uh, like I mentioned, I can really hear that you're excited when you're talking because uh, I think you really have a passion for this. If you've been the, the founder and the CEO, um, I wish you all the best of luck this year because uh, we need more uranium and uh, we're hoping you're gonna hit it big. So thank you very much for your time again today. And I uh, wish you all the best in 2024. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you.